Kula. Please welcome Chris. <laughs> the second one is our regular Bill Marinelli, who is, is a seafood guru from um, Ikan Sekar Bali. <laughs> and the last one is Kun Kong Sak Dok Bua, who is the Vice President at the Plastic Institute of Thailand. Um, when you answer the question, please use the mic because the session is being recorded. Thank you. So the first question is to all of you. Um, what do you think about the film and how, how was it, which part was the most associated with you? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I'm agree that uh, plastic makes some problem regarding the environment especially for the old Mali litter or the Mali debris. Uh, the, the plastic, the plastic association around the world realize this problem. So we, we have the global meeting every year, every year and uh, maybe twice per year. And we, we set the meeting around the world, especially the, the country that make the marine debris. Uh, we, we try to, we know that the problem is the, the improper of the plastic waste management because some people throw the plastic into the liver and, and the plastic float in the, river, in, in the liver and go to the ocean, finally go to the Pacific Ocean. So I, I can uh, I would like to say that, and if I have a lot of information regarding this, so if you have uh, any question, you can you can ask me further. Okay. Billy. Um, Kumuk uh, asked me to obviously to watch the film before coming here today, and um, it got me very curious. Um, my involvement with plastics in the ocean have to do a lot with the ghost nets. And that's what you know, what struck me the strongest in the film. But uh, there are a lot of other films out there that are much, uh, uh, a little bit more professional and better done. Um, this one was was available, uh, but there's there's so much information out there on the incident. I had no idea about how serious the problem was. Was the uh, the amount of plastics that are degrading in the ocean and forming, uh, you know, the small little pellets that are now getting into our food chain and all. I thought it was very interesting that they motored all the way to Hawaii and also how small that skipjack tuna was that they caught in the middle of the ocean. Um, that being said, um, there's, there's, there's so many problems, you know, with, with what we're dumping in our ocean these days that uh, this is just one facet of the many, many problems facing the ocean right now. And uh, I was glad this was brought to my attention, but uh, I'm, I'm a little bit more concerned about what we're taking out of the oceans versus what we're putting in at this point right now. Um, the one thing that uh, they pointed out in the film that I think is very important and something that's you know, easy for us to adopt in terms of, you know, worrying about plastic in our bodies. Um, yes, we should stop throwing plastics away, find another use for them, uh, like building marine reefs out of them, you know, putting them together and putting them in a structure such that, you know, they can encourage fish growth uh, and then eventually be covered with coral and, and actually act as a, you know, an environment for it to stimulate our ocean. You'll notice that all the things that they caught, like those, those buoys uh, especially, there were things growing on them. And we can harvest you know, these plastics uh, in, in a constructive way to use them to actually improve our, you know, the, the ocean environment. But uh, what I'm more concerned about is, is what we're taking out of the ocean. And the advice they gave us 
in terms of eating low on the food, food chain, it, this is probably the smartest thing we can do right now and many different, for many different reasons. First off, yes, this is where the chemical contaminations are going to be the most prevalent, is in the larger uh, marine fish, your tunas, your, your swordfish, your marlin, your big pelagic fish. We should be eating lower on the food chain. We should be eating sardines, mackerel, the smaller fish that do not have this concentration of the PCBs and chemical contamination in them. This is extremely good advice that we all should adopt uh, for more reasons than one. Um, these are the things I, I, I took out of the film. And um, thank you very much. Thank you. Chris? By, by 2050, it's expected that there will be more plastic than fish in the ocean. So back in 1950, there was about 1 million ton, metric tons of plastic produced worldwide. By 1976, it was up to 50 million. 89, it was 100 million. 2000, uh, 2002, it was 200 million. In 2013, it was 300 million. Every single year, we're producing 300 million metric tons or more. So the, the estimate in the movie that there's 100 million tons of plastic, incredibly low. And, and, and there, that's many yeah, years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, but it's incredibly low, and there's far more than what's in the ocean in landfills. So we're just making an incredible amount of plastic, and we have no idea what we're going to get out of that. Highest recycling rates in the world is Switzerland, 52%, and, and Austria is almost that high. Romania, 1%. I think most of the developing world is probably 10%, around that roughly. I mean, this stuff, it's just getting produced in mass quantities, and we, we have no idea what kind of problems we're going to have with it. They, they said we can't clean this stuff out of the ocean. Well, we could probably clean up a lot of it, but it's going to be expensive. It's going to be hard. And what's the point if we're just going to keep dumping more and more and more in the ocean? So um, my concern is how do we figure out how to develop better systems where we're bringing the stuff back in? or we're producing plastics that can go into the ocean and break down and not be a problem. We, we've got to do either or maybe both, but we can't just keep dumping in the ocean because eventually um, there's, there's not going to be any life left except for you know, some kind of horrible um, you know, life that, that we don't want to be a part of anyway. So right now, over half of the birds that they uh, study, are, half of the turtles have plastic in them when, when they autopsy them and nearly all of the birds. So it's not just the fish that, that are having problems. And you know, it's just more and more and more accumulating every year. So big concern. Kun Kong Saka, can you tell us a little bit about plastic? Of, of what is its composition? How was it made? And why won't it biodegrade in nature? The plastic that's uh, come Mainly plastics come from petrochemical that the origin is come from the oil, the, the crude oil. And they some sometimes they can can make from the natural gas also. And they can make from coal also. So we we can we can summarize that allow ninety nine percent of current plastic come from the fossil fuel fossil source. Uh, we call them this uh this uh bit chemical chemical substance. And many times of plastic that we use now, the mostly use uh, we, we call the polyolefin that that to make the polyethylene that main application is a plastic bag and uh, polypropylene is made from the the kitchenware, the some I item that we use in the house, and uh, and and the PVC that we use for for the pipe and for the for the uh, wood composite that uh, artificial wood that we can make from PVC. Many 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 type of plastic now. We and a lot and uh, the re researcher or scientists try to make more plastic type every year, every year. <laughs> so now we, we can make the airplane that, that made from plastic now. 
And why does it break down in the sunlight? It said it's photodegrade. And these plastic pellets that break down eventually, will, will it eventually be completely decomposed? Will that uh, ever happen? Or it just keep breaking smaller and smaller? Okay. Try, some people try to introduce that plastic can break down into the small piece by the, by the light, by the UV. But it's not good. It's not good by, by the scientific idea because it's not completely gettable. It just back to the small piece. And some, uh, some fish from the ocean can eat them and make the problem with, with their life. And the, them, uh, by, by, by their, uh, some make them problem with their organs. And if the people eat the fish, they make some problem to the people also. And uh, the good idea is uh, we choose to use uh, bioplastic that complete the gettable, that they, they can degrade until to the carbon dioxide and the water. This is a complete the gettable. And what are these bioplastic made of? Mainly bioplastic made from the sugar, the sugar cane. And sometimes they can make from cassava. Actually, they can make from any type of the of the plant that have the cellulosic base. And is is that it's 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 a plastic? So those those food box that we use are made from um, sugarcane fiber and cassava, mm -hmm. and that is what call bioplastic. Am I no, correct? No, no, no. Uh, that bio bioplastic. Actually, we make from the sugar because we uh, we we. We use the fermentation, we use the bacteria to digest it into the single mo molecule. And finally, we synthesize it again to make the big molecule to, to be a plastic, not to make from the fiber. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Billy, you are a marine biologist. Can you tell us a little bit more about what are the effects of plastic in the, on the marine animal itself and also on the marine um, ecosystem? You know, I, I was totally ignorant to uh, the, uh, the, the physical uh, detriments of the fish eating plastic. I never, never considered this before, and I never really heard about this until, you know, watching these films. You know, I, I really knew nothing about it. And on everything I, you know, read and um, um, so far since how many weeks ago, it, it seems to affect their, their, their hormones and their uh, ability to, uh, to reproduce. And they're showing this in, now, as, as they said in the film, they're showing this now in, in human populations that eat a lot of uh, large uh, 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 seafood, like, like seals and, you know, and, and God forbid, salmon. Um, people who eat a lot of big fish in the ocean or, or marine mammals, like whales in Japan or uh, Norway. Um, I knew very little about this. My, you know, my, my only, you know, impression of plastics in the ocean up to starting to watch these films and doing some reading was ghost nets, which are uh, a very serious issue. Uh, they didn't elaborate on them, but those nets essentially keep fishing and keep, you know, like like they were saying how it collects garbage and stuff. But they keep doing that until they get so heavy they sink to the bottom. And uh, it, they do catch a lot of fish and birds and, and mammals in them. But otherwise, I was totally ignorant on the subject of, uh, you know, ingesting plastic into the marine, you know, community. I didn't know anything about it. Okay. And um, Chris, you are a specialist in the zero waste field. Can you tell us on what can we and our organization do to, to make sure that the plastic we use don't end up in the environment? I think the first step is, is understanding what kind of plastics you have in your operations. What, what are you guys bringing into a facility? How is it being used? What goes out of the building? What goes into the trash? Um, so like in a typical manufacturing facility, if you catalog everything that you're bringing in for the, operate, for the operations to make your products, and then you get a good understanding of what the waste is, what the trimmings and the, the byproducts and all that are, um, that's, that's the great first step. So you can figure out what's there and what you might be able to do with that to keep that from going to a landfill. Because a lot of times 
It can be used in other products. It can be used to make energy. Uh, there, there are other things that can be done if you're actually looking to do that. The, the second step, once you do everything you can there, is to start taking a look at your products and saying, how can I do this differently? What, what can I use as a different input? How can I, what kind of processes can I change? So that instead of using maybe a plastic blend that's not recyclable, um, there, there are a lot of really nice looking plastic blends that, that companies like to use for their, maybe their plastic bags or whatever the product is. They look great, but then they're, they're single use because of the type of material it becomes. Uh, if, if you can change to something that's recyclable, you know, this PET could be recycled over and over and over. If you, if you ch change to a better um, material, you can make things that, that can be reused so that you at least it can fit into the system instead of automatically being trashed. Uh, so those are, those are two, and then things like looking at your products for things like laminates, where you're putting plastic across wood or something like that. Um, you, you've got to go through and really understand your operations and start looking for opportunities to get rid of the things that just don't make sense if, if you're wanting to have a business that's fitting into our future circular economy. Okay. Um, uh, as you have mentioned that the best kind of plastic that we could choose to use is the bio um, bioplastic but the movie has mentioned and also Billy has mentioned that the plastic has been digested and also there are these chemical like bisphenol A I understand correctly is BPA am I correct yeah um, is there can you tell us a little bit more about the chemicals in plastic and, and are there effects to to us and the marine animal Regarding the BPA or bisphenol A, the bisphenol A is, is the starting chemical to produce the polycarbonate, the PC. The, the main application of the PC in the past, we use them to produce the milk bottom for the baby. So after we know that the BPA may be affect to the to the hormone of of the people, so now we ban to use the PC as as the food contact food con container. So now, uh, actually, the the bisphenol is not much in the PC because the PC is a is a big molecule, so it's not active. The problem is the bisphenol A that may be a residue in the PC. So okay, we 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 ban it. It's okay. Be, uh, now the application of the PC we build to the to the roof, to to the for some decoration from advertisement something like that, or the the artificial glass to make in in the car. And and you mentioned that there's so many kind of plastic. If we are not concerning about bioplastic, is there a type of plastic that we could choose to use that it will be the most friendly in terms of chemicals and, and health? Uh, actually, most of plastic, especially the polyethylene and polypropylene, is not it's not a toxic substance. It's a it's a very basic chemical that I, I can say that you can eat polyethylene and polyethylene without any effect to, to your body if if you can eat that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a toxic, believe me. Uh -huh. But uh, but the problem is some plastic that that burns into the open air with not enough temperature, they will make some toxic gas. And what about being in the ocean, being water? Could these chemicals leach into the water? or The, the chemical that leaks from the plastic, mainly plastic, polyethylene and polyethylene that you see in the film, is not a toxic. But the problem is the f some sea animal, they, can, they, they, they eat it because it looks like their food. And the 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 piece of plastic will stuck in the, their system, metabolism system, and and some sometimes they die. Mm -hmm. And um, Billy, you you have been studying more on this subject. Could you tell us a little more about the other source of plastic that we are producing that the the movie hasn't mentioned? 
you told me about lint, right? From my clothes, from, from fabric and like from microbeads and stuff. Can you tell us about that? Uh, <laughs> you know, the more you look at, <laughs> there, there, there was one article I read about how much um, our clothes, you know, there's so much plastic in our clothes. And just from simply doing laundry, uh, the wastewater from our laundry is, has got a lot of plastic in it that we're, we're, we're not doing anything about. The more you look into the issue about, you know, plastics in, in our environment and our water and everything we do, it, it gets a little overwhelming. And, um, you know, I, I think, uh, I'm sorry, uh, as Chris was saying, you know, I mean, it's, it's making me rethink a lot of what I'm doing in my business and stuff. Uh, you know, like we're getting away from plastic take-home containers and um, we're using, you know, glass jars now and we're using um, uh, metal uh, uh, containers for our mise en place and stuff. Um, the, big, the biggest challenge I face is, is styrofoam. Uh, all my seafood is shipped in styrofoam and it just kills me. But... Uh, the more you look into this issue, I mean, I was overwhelmed the night I first watched this movie and I went into my kitchen and, you know, there were the plastic bags for my food delivery and the plastic containers. My food came in and my plastic water bottles and I, you know, I just, you get overwhelmed a little bit. And I think sometimes you have to, uh, you know, take a step back and, you know, and do the little bit you can. But uh, the more you look into this issue about how much plastic is intruding into into the way we live it's it's pretty overwhelming and also about microbead as well I don't know if anybody is also aware about the microbeads in our toothpaste in our soap in our face wash it's so small that it get flushed into the drain like the lint that it, it cannot get caught in the in the management system and also it ended up being flushed in the ocean but um, the movie had mentioned about or organic pollution. And you had mentioned that, like, choose to eat, um, d lower the food chain. So can you explain a little bit about what happened to these animals when they eat, um, eat all this plastic and then the bigger animals eat them? How, why does it that the farther you move up the food chain, the more toxic they have in their body? The chemicals we're talking about, most of your poisons, your toxins, whether it's, you know, the PCBs or the, you know, the, the, the toxins that are associated with the plastics, any type of, 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 of toxins, they're, they're, they, they go to the fat of the animal. And uh, the, the, as you go up the food chain, they increase in concentration. You know, there's only so much plastic in, in this much seaweed. And then when the sardine eats that seaweed, they have that much plastic in them. And then the next fish comes along and eats that many sardines, and it all accumulates. And thus, so the higher you go up the food chain, the more the product accumulates. One sardine will eat this much algae. Um, a, um, a sea bass will eat so many sardines. A, uh, um, a, a tuna will eat, you know, so many... Uh, uh, sea bass and a killer whale eats so many tuna. You know, the more you go up the food chain, the more these toxins accumulate in your fat. And we are also the top of the food chain. <laughs> we are very high on top of the food chain. And if you look at, you know, like uh, populations that eat, you know, lots of uh, product low in the food chain, you know, they, they tend to have, uh, they, they do have lower rates of heart disease and uh, and cancer and, and 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 what we call the Western diseases, um, it, eating on on top of the food chain is you know detrimental not only to your 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 body but also to the environment. You know we should leave the big fish alone. Okay, Chris, in the field of work that you do, um, are people? generally aware of how much plastic garbage they produce in a day and also are they also aware about where does this go how much of the plastic they use ended up being no. uh, improperly disposed no, I, I think that's there's a still a major lack of awareness even when i was um i was leading zero waste programs for albertson the super value in the u.s we had 2,000 grocery stores that were running zero waste programs where our goal is to divert 90% of our waste away from landfills to productive uses. 
So this, this was a corporate-wide program. We had a mandate from our CEO to do it. And um, I think at best we got nationwide maybe to about 50 to 60 percent um, diversion, which, I mean, is incredibly good compared to our competition, but still nowhere near where we wanted to be. And I would reach out to people in some of our better areas and say, okay, I want to come out and do a visit. I want to do a, um, a, a waste audit so that everyone can see. Because once you implement these programs, everyone kind of gets used to them and they think we're doing a pretty good job and we know what we're doing and we've, we've got great results. Well, it just kind of a little bit slips in here and there and then you go and do an audit at what's supposed to be the best store in the region and 30 to 40% of the trash when they know you're coming is still stuff that should have been recycled. Um, it's just pretty incredible. I mean, we did a lot of really good things that I was proud of when I was there, but we're human. You know, to get everyone in a store where you've got maybe 50 to 60 employees there on board where they're all trying to do it and they're always remembering and you know, they, they make sure to keep, keep the, the waste can far away and all the recycling bins close and they're sorting them the right way, it's really hard. And, and you have to really have a commitment and, and, and give people the right motivation, whether it's you know they personally care about the environment or they care about the finances for the company. Um, it's really hard to get all those things right. Uh, but we have to. We absolutely have to because you saw what's happening to the ocean. We can't just let that stuff keep accumulating. It's, it's going to break down. Yeah. And it's not just to the ocean. We're ended up eating it, too, in the end. Yeah. So you need to be aware, right? Yeah, so um, this last question is goes to all of you in that can you please explain that in what way is your organization doing to help solve this problem? It's uh, my job also. And we talk about the sustainability of the plastic industry that concern to the our environment. So the, we have two ways to do, uh, level up the plastic industry in Thailand, but we also look it back to the plastic waste also. So now we, we talk about the plastic waste management in Thailand, because the marine debris is come from the bad waste plastic management. They come from the bad behavior of the people that throw the garbage into the river, finally go to the ocean. So we, we try to set the system in the Thailand that I start from, uh, I, I study from, from the Japan that I believe that is the best practice in the world to the plastic waste management. We, we try to establish some law from the Thailand government that we call the container and packaging recycling law that we talk about the responsibility of the producer, the plastic producer, plastic uh, converter. It means that, that uh, they convert the plastic pellet to the product, such as the plastic bag or plastic bottle. And we talk about the responsibility of the consumer also. The consumer have a uh, have a job to sourcing the plastic type when they use. They throw in the suitable garbage bin. And finally, we, we try, uh, we will set the recycler, such as the material recycler, and another type of recycling, such as the plastic to oil, plastic to energy, plastic to electric, and finally landfill. But uh, the landfill is not good solution for the all because uh, the landfill is that the landfill. They can leak it to the environment also. So the target is uh, to reduce the landfill. That I saw, I, I know that uh, many people, the, do, the US also have a big portion of the landfill more than 50%. The Thailand still allow 50% now. We, we, we manage. But uh, it's a big job to me, and uh, but I try to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, Billy. Oh God, my business is inundated with plastic. Um, I have a seafood company. I have a, a restaurant. Um, 
what we're trying to do, I mean, we're looking for alternatives in shipping, but, you know, everywhere I look, it seems we're stuck with, uh, you know, one bad choice over another. Uh, we're not using a lot of styrofoam now in the United States. We're shipping in uh, wet lock boxes, but we need liners to insulate from the, from the heat when we're shipping over, especially overseas. So we're using like this foil, which is not really biodegradable. It's uh, like aluminum foil with um, air in between uh, the layers. Anyhow, uh, the one thing that we, we are doing that's positive is we're, we're moving away from all forms of uh, plastic in our takeout and then in our storage uh, containers in the restaurant. And we're moving towards zero waste in the restaurant. Um, we're doing composting and we're working with uh, biodegradable um, uh, bamboo serviceware uh, for, our, for our catering and take home. There's uh, two companies here in Bangkok, uh, UB, uh, UB Plastic and also uh, Grace, uh, G-R-A-C-Z. And they have everything and it's, it's, it's all made with you know, paper and, and bamboo and it's really expensive. So, you know, we're, we're, we're working with them now in, in, in doing, uh, you know, rather than using the plastic plates, the plastic forks, you know, for catering and take home now, we're, do, we're doing that. And I think, you know, the other thing that, you know, we can do together collectively is talk about it and, and bring it up and, and mention it. I mean, I was so ignorant on the subject just a few weeks ago. And, you know, now it comes up in conversation. You know, after I complain about other things, I start complaining about plastic. Um, I, I think just knowing a little bit about it, you know, will affect some change in, in definitely in my operation. And I think in talking to people about it and making people aware of it, uh, it's, it's all good. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, well, it kind of explains what I do in, in kind of helping companies understand what their waste is and, and to break it down. Um, so I'll talk just a little bit about the environment of what I've, what I've seen since I've been here in the last year. Um, there are some leading companies that are doing really great work uh, in, uh, that I've been impressed with, with uh, how they're handling their operations and trying to reduce waste. But in general, I don't think it's been a big concern. Unfortunately, I think it's, it's looked at, it, this, is, this stuff is looked at a cost. And until society set, demands that these things are done, and, and that the costs will be borne in a way that's fair, um, most companies aren't going to have make this a, a priority. So uh, it's kind of up to the consumers to say, hey, you know, we, we, we need to change. Okay, thank you. Um, now I'd like to open the floor for questions. Please use the microphone when you ask questions. Thank you. Really, I had a comment um, more than a question. Just one thing that struck me about what 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 organisations can do, which was your question to the panel. But there are, I mean, mostly you, you covered it. But there's all kinds of things that you just analyse everything you do. So just one simple thing is we're doing a talk on plastic, and there's four plastic bottles up there. This was something local councils in Britain did about eight or nine years ago when this became a big issue in Britain. Um, local councils were kind of pressurised into stopping serving plastic bottles at meetings mm -hmm. and they came with a jug of water, yeah? Mm -hmm. So you've got a big water dispenser out there with glasses beside it, why not do it that way? And just on every level, analyse how you do things. I heard you just messing around with the top of the plastic bottle like they were saying on the video. Um, every part of the plastic bottle becomes that microplastic ultimately. Why do we have those little wrappers at the top of the bottle? That's something for manufacturers to deal with. All people do is take them off. They're not necessary. Not all brands do them. Choose a brand that doesn't have that extra little bit of plastic, you know? Yeah, and there's just on every level, that's just one example of what's on the table. So many things every organization could do. Yeah. But just to be clear, I do love Tassin to go <laughs> to stop using plastic bottle, but uh, these bottles ended up being recycling by our um, uh, the whole point housekeeping, is, just yeah. to clarify. No, <laughs> but the whole point is, we, we, don't, we don't control what happens to these yeah. things afterwards. And yes, I mean, our cleaners at school collect all the plastic bottles and recycle them into other things. Mm -hmm. But the whole point is they're downgrade. Plastic is just bad. Unless it's from plant polymer source, mm -hmm. it's bad in various ways. So you don't know ultimately what's gonna go on, most of the waste that ends up in the ocean and down the river, I believe, isn't, as Kung Komsat said, actually people chucking it in. It is people who have just put it somewhere and it has ended up in a river. Yeah? 
And ultimately, when we buy plastic, which we should try and avoid doing as much as possible, we don't know where it's going to end up. Yeah. Definitely. Anybody else has questions? Please. Uh, I was just seeing in the news um, in the past couple of days that Indonesia is introducing some, um, I guess, laws that require uh, convenience stores and uh, grocery stores to charge for plastic bags to try to discourage people from overusing them. And, and um, first of all, I, I just wonder how, uh, you know, from, from, from the expert opinions, how significant that change is going to make in, in reality. I mean, I, I'm sure it will make a difference of some sort, but how significant that difference would be. Yeah. And second of all, whether uh, or why it's not being done in Thailand. Well, I like to, so first of all, that is being done. I love the system that's being done in Switzerland, right? So basically if you go to grocery shopping in Switzerland, most of the people will bring their own bag. And if you don't bring your own bag, then you have to pay for this paper bag to take home. And Switzerland, Chris, am I correct that they have the highest like recycling rate and, right? No. Okay. You have comments to this? Yeah, I, I, the uh, grocery chain that I work for is mostly standard, large uh, format grocery stores in the U.S. But we had one of the chains was a small format, um, it was kind of a lower, um, lower price store, and we charged five cents a bag at those stores, and we hardly gave out any of them. So it made a huge, huge impact. They probably used maybe 10% of the, the, the volume of uh, plastic bags for the same volume of groceries as at our, our regular format stores. So those charging for bags absolutely help change behavior. So people bring a box or they bring the, the reusable bag, but yeah, you really cut down on the plastic. So there's a lot you can do, um, but, but the legislation, on the legislation side, it's, it's difficult because there are always people pushing back. California tried to do a statewide ban um, I was tracking that really closely before I left the U.S. last year. I know there were massive, um, there was massive pushback right as they were getting towards the uh, implement implementation date. It was going to impact my pre previous work, but I didn't. I left, so I don't know exactly what happened there. But I know there was massive, massive pushback against it. Yeah, and in terms of Thailand, they are a program. For instance, at Tesco, is that if you don't use a plastic bag, you don't get the money back, but you get like a reward program that goes into your, your card. But it's, it's also not very well advertised either, but it is already starting being done. And there are some 7-Eleven like um, in Ajan, Ajan Tan, Klong Tui, no, Klong Tui, right? Klong Tui is also that it's gonna be like a co-op 7-Eleven and they're thinking about like no plastic bag. And on some islands as well, it's being, being initiated already. But can I just add in as well, because I was just saying before some people came in, Britain finally put in a plastic bag charge law just in October last year. And again, it took years of lobbying and going backwards and forwards for the UK government to do it. Same California by the sound of it. But in two months, from October to December, Tesco reduced the plas number of plastic bags they were giving out because people weren't ch buying them anymore by 78% in two months. And that's in a country where people have known for years the issues with plastic bags and where different shops have been doing it off and on and charging. And yeah, even in a country where you think people would know better and start to bring back, it took putting 5p on a plastic bag to do it, but it does work. Yeah, I know in the article I was seeing about Indonesia, they're saying it will be a long way to go before it will work because it's still not being enforced at all. But yeah, it works when it's enforced. I think the um, re retail companies could go and test something and, and implement something that doesn't hurt their business pretty easily. Trying to get legislation would be really, really hard here right now, but there, there's plenty of opportunity for a company to, to implement something and show that they're, they're differentiating themselves and, and trying to be a good custodian. And there are some states in, in the U.S. that pass a law to prohibit like plastic bottles for water, right? Am I correct? Like San Francisco or somebody? or. Sorry, I thought I was on. Unless a state like California makes a change, then, then it's kind of de facto legislation country, countrywide. It's mostly like this one county, you can't give away bags anymore. And it's a positive in that area, but it doesn't really, systemically, it doesn't make much of a difference. Okay. 
I can give you more information regarding the Thailand government. The Thailand government have the idea to ban the grocery plastic bag also, but uh, this idea was again from from the industry, from the uh, plastic industry association. So the plastic, the the fighting between the association with the government, and the finally the association win. So the government stop their idea now, but depend on the government. If the government, the 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 current government has the more power, maybe they they someday they can order the plastic ban. Just your information. Yeah. Um, I was gonna ask about the government involvement in the plastic like waste management earlier, but I think you already addressed it a little bit. Um, I'm just wondering, in countries with very high recycling rate, how involved is the government in driving these behaviors? I've never lived in Europe. I've traveled there. I've, I've tracked their, um, their programs for over the years. I think the government's very highly um, important in what's happening over in Europe with, with recycling. Uh, because they they are it's much easier or at least it has been uh, over the years to enact legislation and taxation that impacts things where, where businesses change their behavior and consumers be change their behavior you know, um, Korea actually has something that's really interesting for for curbside trash pickup you don't pay for anything that's recycled you pay for the actual trash and um, some good friends of ours told us about it you they they break it out into I think half, half a dozen different bins, and they weigh your actual waste. Everything else is either free or it actually counts against that to bring down the total, but it, they do everything they can not to put anything in the trash bin because it's really expensive to landfill something, but everything else is, doesn't count against them. So I, I think legislation it can be a huge, huge benefit, but you're always going to have a lot of pushback from businesses that are going to be neg negatively impacted, so you've got to get a strong coalition uh, of people to push for that or it just it, unfortunately it won't happen businesses can make big changes that, that improve their finances and that, that help them look really good in their um, communities they it's much easier to, to move the needle and if you can get big businesses to do that they can kind of help drag a whole community in that direction by showing people how it's done so that, that's where I've always tried to work I don't know anything about trying to change legislation so mm -hmm. And just to add on that as well, Switzerland also have a very similar system. So basically, every household will buy these trash bags that they will throw away, and then whatever is recyclable, what are you separate into a, a different recycled bin? But what you ended up being thrown away and not recycled, you're paying for every bag of it. So people are very aware of how much you ended up throwing away and not recycling it. So, yeah. Anybody else got questions? Please. I would like to ask Bill about what can be the role of a tourism organization or the restaurant association to tackle uh, this problem. In terms of, uh, of waste in our in our restaurants, well, the biggest movement that we're trying to pull together here in in, in, in Thailand is a slow food movement, um, and it's it's, it's tough. Um, boy, uh, <laughs> this, uh, the, the, the whole, F, the whole, uh, uh, f food sector industry in, in this country is, is so, like, in its infancy, I mean, just, hell, 25 years ago, we didn't have any air conditioned restaurants other than the hotels. Um, it's, we're, it's in its infancy right now, but there's a, there's a, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud and happy to say that there's a new and growing collection of young, um, uh, responsible chefs in, in Bangkok that are, uh, like Dylan at Bolan, Zero Waste Restaurant. There's, there's, there's a growing community of, of F&B professionals in this town that are very concerned with composting and zero waste and, um, you know, sourcing of, you know, not only sustainable but healthy products. Um, 
it's kind of like California in the 70s, um, and I'm really glad to be here for it, but it's really in its infancy. We're trying to pull people together, and it's happening. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to say it's happening, but it's the beginning. Okay. Any more questions? Yes, please. Yeah, um, I would like to have your advice. Um, I'm a consultant for the UN, and we're developing all kinds of projects. In Thailand, we have a low-carbon cities project, and we work with a couple of, of large cities. So Bangkok is excluded because you can argue that they have enough money to tackle a lot of their problems, but we work with Nakhon Ratchasima and Khon Ken et cetera, and Samui as well. The cities indicate that waste is a big problem. Um, we have a couple of million dollars to help them on waste management. What would you advise? What would be the best starting point to help them? From based on your expertise and your uh, your background. A anybody? <laughs> uh, I would start with big companies, um, apartment buildings, anywhere where things can be aggregated easily. Is, is you're going to get more bang for your buck? But I, I would do as much as you possibly can, and then let people know what you're doing, how you're doing it, so that it can be replicated. So if you if you figure out how to recycle in, in large businesses that aren't doing it so far and, and then filter that down to the, the medium-sized businesses and hopefully down to the small-sized ones. You, if you can get the infrastructure in place, right now the, the infrastructure is limited. You go to a recycler and the infrastructure that shows up is a pickup truck that is loaded down with as much cardboard as they could strap onto the back of the truck or as much plastic or whatever. Uh, eventually, hopefully, we're going to have the big trucks that can get the, the most bang for the buck as far as the amount of fuel that you use to move the stuff around, they have routes, they'll, they'll be efficient. Um, but right now, it's, it's, it's pretty inefficient. And so you, you get, you're not going to get the, the maximum recycling rates because people aren't making money off it or they're making very little money. But if, if we can get a more efficient system in place, then you can start pulling in more of the businesses that right now are looking at the financial equation and saying, you know what? I put in the effort for this and I end up worse off. And you know, a lot of business people are, are not going to be going that direction, even though we need them to, they're not going to hurt their businesses to do that. So we've got to figure out how to make it work for everyone. Anybody else? Got for my opinion, we at first we chose give their knowledge about the plastic and and how how we can re reduce, reuse, or recycle them. And for the government, the government should have uh, the good facility enough to, to be the re recycle or to be the landfill. The problem is the, the problem of the plastic is some item that have the word to sell them such as a water bottle is have the value to, to buy, to collect them and buy. The current price is about 10 baht per kilogram for the bottle. So in Thailand, they have some people as a collector, collect them and buy them and earn their life. And But some plastic items such as a plastic bag that has a very thin and very lightweight, so they not worth enough to collect them. And, but in technically, we can convert the plastic back that contaminate some food or some organic substance. We can burn them in the incinerator and make it electric. So if we have uh, incinerator enough in Thailand, we can use them as a fuel to make electricity. <laughs> okay, any more questions from the audience? No? Okay, so in the end, what we're saying, we're, we're not saying don't use plastic or don't eat seafood. I think the takeaway from this film and the discussion is that for us to be aware and be smart of what we consume, what we buy, and what we use, and especially to think about the life cycle of the product that we use. How long can you use it? Can you upcycle it? Can you reuse it? Can you recycling it? And in the end, when this product has 
no life anymore, where does it end up? Could it be recycling or it's going to end up in the environment? And this is, I think it's very important and also that especially to make sure that, you know, it doesn't end up in our food chain because in the end what we throw away is in our tummy and that's not very nice. So I think um, that's it for today. I'd like to thank all the panelists for a very educational um, discussion today and we have a certificate of ap appreciation for everybody.